Good afternoon, uh, Gülçin and Hans. Thank you again for your kind invitation here. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be in this Wimbledon of uh, libertarians, as Anthony Miller, Miller called it. A state of emergency, state of necessity, state of exception. This is the topic of my speech today. We uh, just came out, or believe to come out, of uh, three, more than three years of this sort of, of rulings. Uh, Italy has been, uh, I would say, the, 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 the country where all these things have been uh, experimented and used in other uh, countries of the so-called Western civilized world, which is Western, okay, but uh, civilized, I would say, not so much anymore, at least. Um, we had an ongoing aggression on basic freedoms, on property rights, with lockdowns of businesses, on liberty rights, with forced quarantine and restrictions to travel, and lastly and finally, on the physical integrity of the people with uh, forced uh, vaccine, I don't know if we, we could call them vaccine anyway, mandates to get some, some uh, physical and uh, pharmacological treatment to the uh, happiness of the producers of these uh, products, but uh, not so much for the, for the population. In Italy, we came to uh, the, the hardest version of the emergency rules between October 2021 and uh, March, April 2022, when uh, it was not only compulsory for certain uh, professional categor categories to uh, have uh, either the test or for most of them the vaccine and to show uh, the, um, the COVID certificate, the QR code to get access to their uh, workplaces, to their uh, to the um, to means of public transportation, to restaurants, bars, and so on. It was uh, a nightmare. Um, what has been said about this time is that it was a giant operation of um, of mass hypnosis, and I think it worked. Uh, there is a very interesting book from uh, Matthias Desmet about. Uh, the psychology of totalitarianism, and it is a very fair analysis of what happened during these years. Uh, what's interesting is uh, he says that more or less one third of the population fell for the hypnosis. They, they are hypnotized and still are because there's no uh, hypnotizer who takes care to wake them up, so they go on in the hypnosis. There is one third of a resistance movement uh, I have to, the honor to be one of the, the leaders in, in Italy of the resistance movement, and we did a lot. And by the way, this did a lot to the libertarian movement because we could gain uh, much interest for libertarian ideas, for libertarian uh, themes, books, and so on. I have these surreal conversations in public rallies on places with people asking me which is the best entry book to, to start reading Hans Hermann Hoppe's uh, ideas. And uh, how last week they, they were asking me, 30, 40 people, how can we abolish central banks? So this you wouldn't ever think that this could be possible. So this gives us a, a glimmer of hope. But then there is another third, and these are the worst ones, I think, because the hypnotized, okay, it's not their fault. The other ones are trying to do something against the situation, but then there's a, a good third of the population who don't do anything at all because they go along. In, in uh, Nazi Germany, they were called the Mitläufer, the ones who go together with the mass, with, with what is given to them by propaganda. And the consensus, the general consensus, was fueled exactly by fear, first of all, fear of, of being sick, of being ill, of dying, of uh, an invisible enemy, enemy, a small, tiny virus that you cannot see, and uh, fear because they told the people that there were no cures, no medicines against this virus, which is a blatant lie, and uh, a propaganda which is 
very similar to uh, war propaganda. The, the same phrases, the same uh, way of communicating which were used in Italy and in other countries, especially during World War I, which was the beginning of this all, were used also during this recent crisis. And uh, people fell for it. We, they were actually convinced that we were at war against something. In reality, the war was there, but it was the war of the state against its citizens, as usual. Uh, Randolph Bourne famously said that war is the health of the state. I could see, say the state of emergency, the state of, of necessity is the health of the state, because, it, in fact, war is just the main application of, of uh, the state of emergency, and it gives to the government, to the executive, unheard of powers. They can do whatever they want because there is a necessity, something which has to be dealt with immediately. Will we go out of this situation? Will we manage to come out of this situation? I'm not so optimistic because the signs are there that they are starting again. By the way, although the COVID emergency stopped in Italy, uh, we are now under two new emergencies. We have the, uh, the drought emergency because they thought that there wouldn't be water and rain this uh, summer. After they put this in place, we had terrible rains and floodings and so on, but still we are in the emergency because there's no water. And we are in uh, an ongoing emergency uh, owing to the war in, in Ukraine, so the government can do basically whatever they want as far as military and financial help is concerned to the gang of, uh, of robbers of Ukraine against the gang of robbers of Russia. So this is the actual situation. Plus, all the technological infrastructure that was built and set up during the COVID time is still in place. They could start again in one minute. They can make a decree and say, starting from tomorrow, you have again to show your QR codes and who is not belonging to the, to the good citizens who did whatever they were asked to do, uh, cannot use a bus or a train or, or buy food in a, in a supermarket or whatever. Among the voices of uh, opposition and of resistance against this situation, there has been uh, an Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben, who uh, is not a libertarian, of course, but still is one of the few Italians who maintained the ability to think and to think about what was happening. And in fact, he is uh, researching all these uh, areas since a long time. His uh, biggest work is uh, called Homo Sacer, so the, the human being who is consecrated to something. It is a, a religious expression. And it is um, a long reflection about biopolitics and about the fact that in, in our modern world, uh, the, the naked human being, the sheer existence and survival is confronted with these uh, enormous organizations, not only states and governments, but also over national organizations. He is a professor of philosophy. He um, taught in Macerata, in Verona, in Dusseldorf, in Germany. In 2004, he famously renounced a course that he had to held at the New York University because of the entry rules in the United States. You, you, at that time, they began with fingerprints and biometrics and so on, and that's why he refused to go to the United States because he wouldn't submit to these measures. Now we are more or less used to it. And in fact, his reflection about the state of exception began with the Patriot Act, which is still in force and which is the, the uh, most blatant example of the permanent state of emergency that is, uh, that is still there in the United States and that is the, has been the example for whatever came afterwards. Uh, so one of the books which uh, are part of, of uh, his research entitled Homo Sacer is a book which is entitled State of Necessity, Stato di Necessità. I think there is no um, English translation, uh, unfortunately, but it's a very interesting book. It's a very deep book. Uh, in English, by the way, 
um, you should translate state of exception with martial law, which is not exactly the same, and, and the expression is a little bit confusing, but often you find it referred to as martial law. Uh, the book, as I said, was written in 2003, and it is uh, a commentary and an expansion on two other books by uh, another uh, jurist and philosopher, which is Carl Schmitt. Uh, in, um, in the 20s, he wrote two books about the same, uh, the same topic. One is on dictatorship, and the other one is political theology. And the, the most important quote from the, from the second book is this uh, quote, sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception, unquote. So uh, Karl Schmitt said that the, at the core of the power of the states, there is the decision about the state of exception. Uh, in German, the expression is a little bit, um, it's far, you can interpret it in two ways, because it's Entscheidung über den Notzustand, den Ausnahmezustand. And über, about, can mean uh, both if there is a state of exception and can mean also what the content of this state of exception is. So what powers have to be given to the, to the, um, to the, um, to the government or to the king or whatever. Uh, for Karl Schmidt, of course, this was a good thing because at the end of the day he thought that the, the, um, what politics had to do was to uh, take a decision. So uh, what, is, what is necessary in politics is take a decision, whatever the de decision, and the decision uh, is useful to give legitimation to whatever politics decide. As you know, Karl Schmidt, uh, in, at least in the first part, uh, was in favor of, of the Nazi regime, and the uh, construction of the, of the National Socialist regime was exactly done with uh, this position regarding the state of exception. It was the famous Article 48 of the, of the um, Constitution of Weimar, which gave the possibility to the president to suspend a certain amount of, of uh, basic rights and basic, uh, um, and, and basic guarantees to the citizens. Uh, Schmidt, of course, was among the writers who thought that uh, this enumeration of the, of the rights and guarantees that could be suspended during the state of exception was not, uh, was not compulsory, that uh, basically the president could do whatever he wanted to make sure that the, that the power of the state and the existence of the state was granted. In his book on dictatorship, um, uh, Karl Schmidt gives a distinction between two sorts of dictatorships, the commissary dictatorship and the sovereign dictatorship. The first, the commissary has the aim to maintain the existing status quo. So the, the commissary dictator is one who must preserve what is there, and to do this, he has the power to suspend all laws to, to, and to commit violence, basically. This is the, 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 the core of, of, of power. The sovereign dictator is the one who is in the course of establishing a new order. So um, Karl Schmidt recognizes a sovereign dictator, for example, during revolutions, when the revolutionary new government is in the process of establishing a new legal order. Anyway, in both cases, uh, Schmidt sees that the, the core of this power is that of suspending the existing rights and suspending the whole of the normal legal rules. Uh, so the state of exception is a concept about the limit. It's the limit of law. Um, the, the law comes until a certain, a certain point and after that it has to be suspended because something more important than the legality, than the respect of rights, comes in place. And this, you can note, is exactly the same which happened during the recent crisis. Uh, what did they say? The main aim of any government is 
to make sure that the virus does not uh, expand, that there are no more cases of virus, of, of, of people who are uh, infected by the virus, however they were uh, asserting, because you know that the famous PCR tests were fraud as well, and they did, didn't find anything. Uh, the best statistics say that uh, they have uh, more than 95% of false positives, so it doesn't mean anything, but still, this was what the propaganda told us and told the whole world. Uh, what we have to do is to stop the, the virus, which because we don't have any cure, this was false again. And at this point, given this uh, necessary situation, the situation of emergency, the governments in all the world uh, gave themselves extraordinary powers. And they did whatever was necessary according to their interpretation to make sure that this aim was respected. So we had the same thing which uh, Schmidt recognized. We, ha we, we had a situation where the, the, um, the, the limits of the law were suspended, were blocked. Agamben says uh, that on the same page of the, of the uh, state of necessity, state of, state of exception, is the right of resistance, which significantly was uh, what was opposed in the citizenship. We had the government taking extraordinary liberties and powers, and on the other side, the resistance of the, of the citizens, which was uh, quite successful sometimes, and even funny. We, we, had, uh, we had funny years during, during uh, the past, and uh, we, we, I participated to restaurants who kept open uh, uh, although there was the curfew and who didn't ask uh, for, the, for the vaccine passports and so on. And uh, there was a little resistance movement and it was on the, same, on the same level. So the resistance was illegal as the extraordinary powers were illegal. The book of Agamben uh, gives a very interesting historical reconstruction of the, of the uh, state of exception. And uh, he gives a, a modern and an, an, an ancient origin of, of, this, uh, of these extraordinary powers. The modern origin comes from World War I. The, the big uh, experiment in uh, creating a new type of economy, a new type of society where all citizens must uh, necessarily collaborate for a common effort of beating the enemy was World War I. Uh, in, during World War I, you had the suspension of the, of the gold standard and of the specie payment of, of the monies. You had the fraud of the, of the uh, state titles for financing the war. And you had a command economy uh, in all countries which were involved in the war. And um, especially in the United States, there was a very interesting book by Murray Rothbard about the um, war economy in World War I. And he aptly says that uh, World War I was the, the way by which the progressive movement in the United States managed to get hold of the administration of the, of the federal government. And this was the experiment that transformed completely the United States. Uh, and the transformation was complete during the, the Roosevelt era and the New Deal, when the traditional and old liberties of, of the United States uh, were lost. Uh, basically, what happened during World War I? The idea uh, has been to break up, the, or, or better to say, to fuse uh, the traditional separation of powers. Usually you had an executive branch, a legislative branch, and uh, a judicial branch. And uh, the legislative and the executive branch are fused together. And this happens by means of the decrees. The decrees are... Um, decisions by the government which have the force of law and which are immediately applicable and uh, sometimes not always they have to be approved by the, by, the, by the parliament and the parliament is transformed in a gathering of yes men and yes women who just accept what the government does. This is the situation which is common in most European countries by now 
initially for sure. Uh, I, I made just uh, personal statistics uh, uh, for the first uh, six months of 2023, and more than 90% of whatever the parliament passed is just uh, approval of government decrees. So in fact, the laws are made by the government, and the parliament is just there for, for, for saying yes. And um, the, the funny thing is that this proves that democracy is a scam and a fraud as well, because uh, you can vote as a citizen for the yes man in the parliament, and they do whatever the government says. So, for example, in a country like Italy, you have no chance to influence however the politics of the government, because you, the, the most you can get is to vote your representatives in this assembly of, of, um, of clowns. It's satire, so <laughs> we have the same laws in, in, in Italy, so it's, it's forbidden to offend the government. It's uh, offense to the institutions of the republic. And uh, I, have, I have a few trials coming up for this, uh, for this crime. It will be happy. We will be happy to defend my clients and to see what we, we can do. By now, uh, on the side, in, in criminal courts, I was uh, hugely successful. Not so much in civil and administrative courts where the judges are more in line with the government and uh, they, they wouldn't go along. Uh, anyway, it's obvious because if, you, if someone is, is uh, declared innocent of some crazy crime like offending the institutions of the Republic, no big harm done. If uh, you have a class action for, for uh, damages uh, owing to the illegal laws of the government, it's another thing, and so they make sure that the judges are in line with, uh, with the government. Another very interesting part of uh, Agamben's book is the ancient historical reconstruction of the, of the um, state of exception, which uh, goes back to an institution of the Roman law, which was called justitium or senatus consultum ultimum. Uh, justitium is a very interesting word because it has the same origin as solstitium. This, so the, the real meaning is jus stat. The, the law is silent, stops. And this is actually the meaning of, of this institution. It was the, the Roman version of the, of the state of, of uh, emergency. And it was, by all means, a suspension of, of the law. And uh, a, a similar origin comes in the, in the other expression, which is the senatus consultum ultimum, so the last decision by the, by the Senate. But ultimum has um, uh, an etymological significance which comes from uls, which means beyond. So the idea is that the Senate authorizes any Roman citizens, not, not only the, the magistrates, to go beyond the law, or better to say, to take the force in their own hands and do whatever is necessary to avoid damage to the, to the Republic. That's also the formula that was used by the Senate in these decisions. It, it is uh, videant consules, so may the consuls see whatever is expedient to save the state, and this, what was expedient usually was uh, killing someone. So this is, uh, at the end of the day, the, the someone or lots of people. This, this was, at the end of the day, the, the significance of, of this uh, Senatus Consultus Ultimum. And uh, what is also very interesting of the Roman experience is that, uh, at least according to some opinions, what happened during this suspension of the laws was not to be judged according to the laws. Uh, so if, if uh, some political opponent of the status quo was murder, murdered during the, during the uh, state of emergency, uh, he could not be uh, put under trial for the crime afterwards. This was not always like that. The, the most important trial uh, connected with the justitium is that of Cicero, who uh, killed the, the, the participants to the conspiracy of Catilina without a due trial, and for that he was put on trial afterwards and he was exiled. So it's not 100% sure how the treatment was. But the interesting thing is 
that uh, the, the, the characteristics of the justitium are more or less the same of our modern state of necessity. So we have a status of enemy, so there are no rules, which is what often people say is the characteristics of anarchy. Anarchy is that there are no rulers, uh, but uh, anomy is there are no rules, so anything is, is possible. The aim is the preservation of the legal order, the legal order of the Roman Republic. Uh, there is no legal evaluation because jus stat, the, the law stops during this, this timing. And you have a sort of free-floating force, free-floating power. The same is true of the establishment of the empire. Uh, the empire, and especially the name of the emperors, Augustus, Augustus is the first, but it was a title which was given to any emperor afterwards. The name has the same origin of auctoritas and so the authority and it was the power of the senate it was not a direct power the senate did not have a direct power on the citizens but it gave the legal sanction or more better to speak the the sanction of the force of the state to whatever the magistrates did so at the core of the state we find and this is very very interesting we find lawlessness so what is in the innermost uh, powers of the state is the power to suspend all the laws. And so all governments, all states, and this is demonstrated by the, by the state of necessity, are illegal, are violators of rights, of property rights, of rights of freedom, of life, and so on. And uh, in this sense, the quote from uh, Karl Schmidt, that sovereign is he who decides about the state of exception, is uh, dramatically true. So, uh, sovereign is he who has the brute force to exercise uh, power and decision, as Karl Schmidt would say, without any uh, any restriction and without any legal uh, legal restriction. So. The, the conclusion of uh, Agamben, and it is a desperate conclusion, is that law is void in its center. Law doesn't mean anything. Law, the law of the states, is just uh, brute force and oppression. His conclusion is so desperate that he wrote a recent article where he said, uh, I refuse our society because during these last years, the society was made up of accomplices, of, of uh, people who were uh, accessories to the crimes that have been uh, committed. And uh, it's just crimes and accessories to the crime. We don't even have uh, a real culprit because who is the culprit of the whole situation is, is not clear. Of course, he is not a libertarian, so he doesn't see that the culprit is this structure in which we are forced to live is the state, the government itself. And so uh, I think that uh, starting from the, from the uh, desperate conclusion of Agamben, he says it would be necessary to construct a totally different society, but he doesn't know how. We have a solution for a totally different society, and we have a solution for a totally different way of examining law. Uh, in uh, um, in um, human action, Mises' human action, there is a quote, uh, he, he modifies a quote uh, of the motto of the em Austrian Emperor Ferdinand I. And his motto was uh, Fiat justitia et, et pereat mundus, which means just let justice be done even if the world has to be perish for the justice. And uh, Mises said no. We, uh, utilitarian economists, we say fiat justitia ne periat mundus. So let justice be done in order the world, that the world does not perish. So justice saves the world. And I think this is the same attitude of a libertarian way of interpreting law and, and uh, justice and whatever is connected to, to justice. And so I'd like to... Uh, end my, my presentation with my 
suggestion of a, of a personal solution. Uh, first of all, uh, there shouldn't be any state of exception in a legal rule. The rules are those and you cannot deflect from the rules any, any way and in, from, for any reason because the rules are the foundation of a just and acceptable society for anyone. So the first question that uh, you must confront as a, as a libertarian jurist is this. Is there an objective test about what is law? So how can we say what is law? As you know, there are two schools of thought, uh, which I think are both equally uh, flawed in some ways. The w one is the positivist school of thought. So in a nutshell, uh, you, you have different schools. You have the, the American and, and British school. You have the G European continental school. You have Hart and, and Kelsen and so on. But in a nutshell, it says that rules are the ones which are posited according to a valid procedure. So, for example, Hans Kelsen, who is the most famous uh, European positivist, says the, the laws are a sort of a pyramid, and at the top of the pyramid there's a, a Grundnorm, a basic norm, which says, which is not written, and which is the, the rule that recognizes the power to uh, set up a constitution and in the constitution you have the procedure to make valid laws and from there you go down the pyramid and you have all the, the, the laws which come after the, the basic norm. Anyway, the question for the positivists is has the law been done according to uh, the right procedure? If yes, then the law is valid. And it is, uh, this is funny, the excuse of most uh, uh, goons uh, of totalitarian regimes. The, the, um, the uh, ones who worked in the Nazi concentration camps or in the Russian concentration camps, they said, I was just following orders. And this is exactly what a uh, policeman said during these three years. I, I talked to lots of policemen and I said, do you, do you see that this is all wrong? You cannot... Uh, you cannot tell a uh, shop to close or you cannot check uh, these passports because this is illegal, this is against fundamental human rights. And the answer was, I'm just following orders. I have, uh, I, I'm not interested in what you're saying. And this is the positivist attitude. On the other side, you have the school of uh, natural law, which is the idea that laws have to conform to certain principles, uh, to the nature of man, to divine law. There's a, a big tradition of, of uh, natural law according to re religious principles. So the natural law should be the reflection in human things of, of divine law. I think that uh, we libertarians can have um, a better answer to, to the question. First of all, what is law? Uh, my proposal is that law is something which deals with the fundamental relationship um, between man and time. Uh, and in fact, you have the three, uh, the, the three concepts which are always related to law, which are life. Life is the relationship of man with the future. Uh, if you die, there's no future, quite obviously. Liberty is the relationship of man with present, and it is the right to use your body, to use yourself according to your decisions. And property is the relationship of man with the past. So whatever you did in the past and in a Lockean fashion, uh, however you mixed your work with land, with some external factor, this establishes property and the, the other way of establishing property is uh, free exchange, so contracts. And uh, if, you, if you look at legal rules, they all have some sort of relationship with life, with liberty, or with property. So this is the content of law. The second question is, uh, how could, can we establish which laws are just, which laws are uh, are acceptable in a free society, which rules do not uh, infringe on the fundamental rights of human beings. And here 
Uh, in fact, you, you don't have to look very far because the answer is here. It's the ethics of uh, argumentation. So to establish what rules are right, what rules are, are consistent with human nature, you could say in, in a philosophical fashion, you have to use the principles of the ethics of argumentation. This means that uh, you have to accept some basic uh, rules of, of engagement in, in the rational discussion about, about law and jurisprudence, and these basic rules regard self-ownership, acceptance of the other as uh, an individual self-owner. And once you establish these natural uh, consequences of the ethics of argumentation, you see clearly that uh, almost all laws which we have in force right now are illegitimate because, as Frédéric Bastiat said, uh, law is perverted. And uh, what law is there for is to make sure that a group of, of uh, robbers, uh, that a gang of, of, uh, of criminals has the right, the legitimate right, to uh, take away your property, to take away your life, to conscript you, and to do whatever we know states do. And how they do it, it is uh, through the basic legal void, which is at the core of the states, and uh, they do it through a psychological mechanism. Because although we, we libertarians know that all these rules are illegitimate, they claim for themselves the legitimacy. And legitimacy is a psychological phenomenon. It is the conviction that this structure is the right structure and this structure has the right to impose laws on other people. And this is where we have to fight. And uh, the, um, the, the means of fighting are uh, a twofold. On the one hand, we have to expose our ideas, show how the things should be done and how a, a libertarian reflection about law should, should look like. And the other one, the great uh, power of, of the people is civil disobedience. And this has been the, the great resource during these last years because uh, civil disobedience was the strongest thing you could do to uh, take away the power from the, from the existing structure. In fact, if laws are not obeyed, if the people rebel against laws, you don't need any violence. You just need to say, no, thank you. I don't comply with, with these rules. And this is a very, very strong and powerful possibility. And this may be a glimmer of hope for the future. Thank you for your attention.